Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Acts of the Apostles Bible study. Keith, what chapters are we covering today? Well, Father Mark, I want to say good morning to you. And we are going to start in chapter 16. I think we're going to try to get through at least 16, 17, 18. We might delve into 19. We'll see how it goes. I think, I think, I don't know about how you are with this stuff, but for me, I can say we're going to do all this and then I can get stuck in one spot and just be blown away about how amazing it is. And get, and before I know it, I've been talking about one thing for 30 minutes. So yeah. I would yeah, like to get through two or three chapters today, um, but we'll see what happens. Keith, you've you had a just a, just a, it's off topic, but you you have a huge uh, news uh, in your life, eh? a big launch. Do you want to mention that to the viewers? Oh yeah, well um, yeah, I mentioned this on my channel yesterday, but um, this this book I've been working on for for for, for um, the last year or so, I basically officially have started telling people they should check it out on Amazon. It's called The Conference Guide to Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a book written really for people who are making their way into the church as converts to help them understand the nuances and things that will happen to them as they convert. It's not really an apologetics or theological manifesto, so to speak, as more as it is a, like, a, like a guidebook, a handbook for people coming into the church. So I'm excited about it and been working on it for a while. So people can get it on Amazon and hopefully. Sweet. Get it. And what's what's the subtitle? It's the. It says uh, your first year in the church. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing that I felt like I feel like a lot of converts need, um, because you go through an RCIA class or you 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 meet with someone and you preach whatever like what I did, you come into the church but and you can learn a lot of the basic theological things but there's some things that you just can't really be taught in a class like mm -hmm. how do you find a local church mm -hmm. how do you tell your friends you're catholic mm -hmm. how do you know where to start in terms of different devotions and things like that so anyway i'm uh i'm pretty excited about it and i've, I've been getting some good response from people so sweet pumped, that might so be that might be a good gift if, if if anyone out there knows someone who's taking in our cia right now that might be a because they'll be becoming Catholic in a few weeks at the Easter Vigil, so they might need a nice guide for their first year in the church. So, <laughs> yeah, I I know I I could have used one. Um, yeah, and I've, many people I've talked to have said the same type of thing. But yeah, I mean, there's so many books out there about about converts and about what people learn and do as they're coming into the church. But this one's a little bit different. So sweet. Well, yeah. um, that's exciting. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm really I'm really excited to see how this helps people beautiful well, so let's start with our yeah go. prayer in the name of the father and the son of the holy spirit amen. amen come holy spirit fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth amen amen in the name of the father and the son of the holy spirit amen amen okay so well we're sitting here I to say good morning good morning keith why don't you take us away okay so we're sitting here the day after Ash Wednesday, and so Lent is upon us, and we're in the middle of our Lenten journey towards Easter and, and Good Friday, and, and ultimately this idea of penance and sacrifice for the Lord to help us. And as I, as I was reflecting on that, looking through what's happening now in Acts, we're kind of making a transition in this book from really like learning about what the, the apostles were doing in Jerusalem and then about Peter and then Paul. And now we're going to start to see what happens when, when Paul goes on these, they call them these missionary journeys. And he's, he's basically taking the, the decree from the, the church about how the Gentiles are to be brought in. And he's going out now to share this gospel message and, we're going to see some really interesting things here that takes place on this journey. Now, Paul is with, he's no, he's not with Barnabas anymore. He had been traveling with Barnabas, but they had a separation because they had a disagreement really ultimately about uh, John Mark. And 
Paul didn't want to take Mark with him because at one point in time, he had left them while they were on their trip for some reason, but Barnabas wanted him. So they separated. And now Paul is traveling with, with Timothy and Silas. And Timothy, of course, is, is a young man. And we read about him in the first part of chapter 16. It says that he was, he was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but Timothy's father was a Gentile. And in verse 2, it says he was well spoken of by the brethren at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul, Paul wanted to accompany him. And he took him and he circumcised him because of the Jews that were in these places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So we, we have this weird instance right away where just before this in the Jerusalem Council, we were said that this was the only thing required of Gentiles was to abstain from blood and from meat strangled, from, from animals who were strangled, and from fornication and from idols. But now here's Paul, and he is circumcising Timothy because most people knew that Timothy was sort of a um, he was a mixture of he had he had a Jewish mother and he had a a Gentile father, and I think the reason why Paul does this is because he wants everyone to understand that Timothy is he's on this mission and he doesn't want to cause this great controversy. Apparently, there were a lot of people still running around, and we'll see this later, of course, and if you can read Galatians, Paul talks about this there too, where the people he refers to as the Judaizers that are always trying to find something wrong with what the, the church is doing and to say that, well, you're not Jewish enough and you're not uh, keeping the Old Testament commandments. And I think maybe Paul does this with Timothy because he just doesn't want to deal with it. He doesn't want to have to always be addressing this issue but i think it's interesting you know you think well how would anybody even know, you know <laughs> how would he even know and but apparently and we'll read this later that um in the new testament people would spy on paul and timothy while they were i don't know getting dressed or taking a shower i don't know whatever to see if they were circumcised or to make sure they were keeping the rules now i don't know if this is necessarily the best uh new convert class, but this is what Timothy was willing to do in order to to not cause a stir. And I don't know, Father Mark, I think sometimes, even though we don't have to do certain things, sometimes it's wise to do them just to avoid unnecessary conflict. Have, have you ever experienced that? I'm sure as a, as a priest, you have people all around you all the time that, you know, um, can sometimes get lost in minor details. And sometimes it's best just to go, have it your way. We're going to move on yeah. to get on to the big things. Well, circumcision is pretty extreme, you know. I mean, it's not a, the best parallel, but obviously, you know, there's a, a certain courtesy you, you, you pay when you're in, in different settings, you know. Like if you go to a Ukrainian Catholic Mass, their liturgy is quite different. And only an extremely obnoxious person would kind of go in there saying, well, I'm, you know, whatever, I'm not Ukrainian, so I'm going to, you know, look with disdain on their liturgy. Well, no, like a good person goes and says, okay, like, tell me what to do, show me, you know, you're very respectful and, you know, uh, whatever else. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's same thing when you travel. Like, I remember, I think I might have shared this even in the last video, Um you know, when, when you go to India, a lot of the chapels, a lot of the churches, everyone kicks off their shoes and goes into the church bare feet. Well, again, only a really obnoxious person would be like, well, we don't do that in Canada. I'm leaving my shoes on. It's like, to me, dude, take your shoes off. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're in India. That's how they show respect, you know. And, and again, you can go through, you can go through the list. Um, so to, to, now again, I mean, there's a kind of a big difference between taking your shoes off and allowing yourself to be circumcised that's as an adult a, a whole lot, that's a whole other level you know um but or i mean same thing too like um i i really don't know if this is the best example but you know if you're living in a in in a very say you're living in a muslim nation say say you you're um i don't know what for whatever reason and during you know ramadan um I mean, you know, is it right to be cooking cooking sausages, cooking hot dogs in the middle of the day, you know, like, you know outside barbecue? Like, you know, is, there's, 
you know, a legitimate respect and courtesy you pay to other people that isn't compromising your own faith. It's just being, you know, a decent human being, you know. Now, again, I, I, I don't know if that's exactly related to allowing yourself to be circumcised to uh, not give offense to the Jews, but... Well, I think it's, I think it's just a classic example of picking your battles, you know. Yeah. Because you yeah. Can, and there are some people that just they want to fight about every little thing, and you see yeah, it everywhere. Yeah. But I, I think that that mindset of well, I'm gonna fight every battle about every topic, every point, every this, every that. I, I, my own personal opinion is you won't get very far in ministry if you're gonna get hung up on everything that yeah. people struggle with and that people disagree with. Um, so picking your battles is important when you're, when you're sharing, sharing your faith with people, when you're, when you're doing ministry. Yeah. It, and it's, it's amazing. I think like a modern day version of that, that I, that I would see would be if people want to argue about, well, what clothing are you supposed to be wearing or, you know, and, yeah, I think that you should dress appropriately. Like, let's say when you go to mass, I think you should dress appropriately. Mm-hmm. I think you should, you should, um, you know, show respect to to work to what you're doing. But there'll be some people that want to, they just want to light into you about, well, you didn't do the right thing, you didn't you didn't wear the right thing, or you didn't say the right thing, or I mean, yeah, 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 and yeah. I don't know. I think everybody's got their thing that's the most important thing to them, but sometimes we have to recognize that the thing that might be most important to me might not be the most important to everybody else in, in, and so you pick your battles and everyone has that thing where they just go, Nope. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to get lost in this. So for Paul, I think that, you know, this could be, this could be that, that instance where it says the reason why it says because of the Jews that were in those places for, they all knew that his father was a Greek. So this is the why for Paul. And he mm-hmm. he's saying that he people are going to say, well, Timothy, his dad is a Greek, so, um, you know, is Timothy really a Christian? Is Timothy really, you know, whatever? So Paul just says, look, I'm going to show that he's with us. He's yeah, yeah, he's yeah. made this transition. He's he has given himself over to this, and we're not going to unnecessarily cause a big stir over that issue. But mm-hmm. let's let's move on here. So so it says that that these the churches are strengthening in the faith they're increasing in their numbers and i'm in verse six now in in chapter 16 and says and they went through the region of phrygia and galatia having been forbidden by the holy spirit to speak the word in asia that this is an interesting idea you know the holy spirit doesn't want them to go to asia he he wants them someplace else apparently so which i think that in and of itself is is an interesting verse that the holy spirit would say nope i don't want you to preach the gospel here i want you to go over there and that that just shows that the Holy Spirit is at work in, in this, and there are some times and places where it's not right to go, and this was one of them for for these guys. He, he had different different plans for them. So it just kind of goes through that they're, they're, they're making these trips, and this vision appears to Paul in the night of a man of Macedonia standing and pleading with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, one interesting thing here, Father Mark. Now, you, you're going to begin to see a switch here. Luke, who is writing the book of Acts, now begins to start to write in the first person. He's not just simply saying, Paul did this, Paul did that. He's saying us, which is an indicator mm-hmm. that now Luke is hes an eyewitness to these things. He's there. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. part of this mm-hmm. trip. Mm-hmm. So what you're what we're getting in Acts now is we're getting the account of a of a man from a man who was there. So it says that they set sail from Troas to they make a direct voyage to Samothrace following Neapolis, Neapolis, and then from there to Philippi, which is what we're going to talk about today quite a bit. So they're over in Philippi, and they run into this woman named Lydia, and Lydia is she's it says that she's a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. So she's, she loves God and she opens their, her house to them. And she says, if you've judged me to be faithful, come to my house and stay. I love that. It, but it says in verse 15, this is interesting that she was baptized with her household. And again, mm-hmm. this is one of those verses in acts. And there's a couple of them 
that talk about entire households being baptized. So mm -hmm. uh, do you do you get arguments from people at times who say, well, you shouldn't baptize babies or kids. It's only adults. And what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, on, on the extremely rare occasion, I mean, the practice of baptizing infants is, you know, we've been doing that for from the beginning. And not only Catholics, there's, there's a lot of, you know, other, there's Christian denominations who, who baptize infants. And so it, it's, it's one of those things, I mean, you know, when someone makes it an issue, you're like, hey, like, do we really have to rehash this debate that, you know, I just go, go, go check the, the scriptures on the debates. And um, yeah, so uh, I guess the, the bottom line is, um, baptism replaced circumcision and they circumcised infants. Circumcision made you part of the, the you know, the people of God, the, the, the nation of Israel, the, 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 the uh, chosen people, and baptism, you know, saves us, uh, Scripture says, uh, and makes us part of the family of God, adopted children of God. So if and it's it's also the whole thing, like you know, the, the idea that oh, uh, you have to be old enough to to make your own decision, and then you're saying that it's 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 reliant on the person. It's not a free gift of God, you know. And as just as a, an infant of eight days could be part of the the, the family of God, the, the chosen children of Israel. So too, a child, you know, through the decision of the parents, can be can be washed clean and saved, and and be part part of the family of God. And there's always obviously the understanding that the child will be raised in the faith, and and before the child even, you know, like the, from the from the child's youngest years, the child learns to to know and to love God. You know, so yeah, and I think it's important to say that as Catholics talking about this baptism issue, I don't think anybody's saying that we can say, well, because of this verse, it specifically says that infants were baptized in this house. We, mm -hmm. But because it doesn't say that. But mm -hmm. I think it's, I think, uh, you know, you see this a few times here. And I think what's important is to say, well, there could have been infants in the house. And it doesn't say that there weren't. And when it says whole household, that could mean a lot of things. And it probably does mean that there were children there. But the point of it is, is it doesn't say that only the adults were baptized. And then, mm -hmm. of course, we look at the practice of the early church and of the apostles, and we we clearly see that's what they did. So, mm -hmm. but it's it's difficult, I think, for people who want to say, "Well, show me in the Bible where it says that." Um, but I was I I heard a I think I, I heard podcast a couple weeks back where, man, I can't remember the guy's name who said this, but he was talking about, it was on the Cordial Catholic podcast, and he was talking about baptism and infant baptism in that mm -hmm. debate. And he was saying, he was talking about these verses as, these are verses that support this idea. And in Catholicism, that's what we see a lot of. That, that There may not be explicit things in the scripture that say, this is the verse that says that, um, bapt infants were baptized, but what, what mm -hmm. was interesting was, but these are verses that support it. And what was interesting to me was that he was pointing out that a lot of people believe things that aren't specifically explicitly said, but that are supported in the scripture. For example, he, he said, point to the chapter and verse that says women can take communion. Oh, yeah. And, and <laughs> I mean, obviously That's he believes, he obviously believes that. that women can take yeah. communion. But mm -hmm. there, if, if you want to apply that same standard to every belief yeah, that yeah, even, true. even yeah. people who would oppose infant baptism would have, you say, okay, well, then show me the chapter and verse then. And yeah. it's just funny to me how people want to throw those things out at, 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 the, at us Catholics and say, well, where in the Bible is the rosary? Or where in the Bible right yeah. now? Where is Lent uh, yeah, in the Bible? Yeah. But if you turn that around on them, it can be yeah. like, well, what are you talking about? Of course, of course, well, it might not explicitly say that, but it supports it. Yeah. So anyway, I could get stuck in this for a long yeah. time, but or I don't we're, know. We're, we're in the Bible. Yep. Does it say that Americans can be baptized? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, we're, show me that in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can and say I, that about anything, really. You can yeah. say, well, and, and of course, we're not advocating that you have to be able to do that. Yeah. 
but it's funny how so many others will advocate that towards us, but they mm-hmm. themselves, they have a different way of dealing with it. Yeah. So anyway, so Paul, Paul and Timothy and, and Silas and Luke and maybe others, I don't know, are, are there with, with Lydia in this place. It says, and she prevailed upon us, which means that they basically did what she said. So next thing we're going to see happens here is that these guys are going to what they refer to as a place of prayer, um, which indicates they didn't say that they're going to the synagogue. So we don't really know what this place of prayer is, but it's, it's, a, it's a place where they, where they gather together and they're met by this slave girl who it says had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by soothsaying. So this slave girl has like this psychic ability or some kind of power, or whatever, to tell people's fortunes or whatever. She follows Paul and us crying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she did for many days. But Paul was annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, Father Mark, is this the first time we see an exorcism done by somebody other than Jesus or the Twelve in in um, in the Scriptures? I don't know. If I mean, it could, it, it could be. I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, doesn't it say earlier that they they healed people and cast out demons? I I, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, like this, this is, is an, a specific, this is an explicit one yeah, though. A specific example of of why they would do that. So. They they cast Paul, they cast the demon out of her, but when her owners saw that the hope of their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace and rulers, and they brought them to the magistrates. They said, and I like this. They said these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs which is not lawful. Or they advocate customs which it is not lawful for us Roman citizens to accept or practice. So then they get this big this big uproar. It says in the near beat them with rods. Now let's not yeah. just kind of gloss over that. Yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah. beat these guys with rods for preaching the gospel and casting out this demon from this girl. It says when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. I mean, this is not a welcoming place for these guys, and they're there sitting in jail. I don't know. Have you ever tried something in, in the church and it didn't work, and you're like, well. I guess that didn't go over so well. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe we ought to do something different. But these guys are thrown in prison after being beaten. But verse 25, that this is one of my favorite stories in the, in the book of Acts. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. It's like a little church service in there. And suddenly mm-hmm. there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Wow. Yeah. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Then he called in for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in that house. And he took them out. It took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and then he was baptized at once with all his family. So, And then it says he brought them up into his house. They set food before them, and he rejoiced with all his household that he had believed in God. Now, let's talk about this for a second. I mean, there's so many things we could unpack here, but these guys are in prison. And what's their attitude like, Father Mark? What do you see them doing? Well, I mean, it's like you say, it's it's one of the most remarkable stories in Acts. I mean, it has to be highlighted. It, it says specifically in verse 24, they were in the inner prison. So they were in the deepest, darkest part of the prison. And also it was about midnight. So the darkest time of the day. So they're in the deepest part of prison, the darkest time of day. They were just beaten up, and they're in chains. To me, that's a, it's a biblical image of about as low as you can get, you know, like being in the depths of 
you know, a bad situation. Like some people think, oh, I'm really in a bad situation. Well, you know, it doesn't get much darker than this. And again, what's what's mind blowing is that they were singing hymns, you know. And so it's the call to praise, you know. The scripture says, "Oh, bless the Lord at all times, a song of praise ever on my lips." You know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. They're doing this, and again, what happens? The earth shakes, the chains break, the doors open. I mean, it's it's you know, it's such a beautiful image, and especially the call to faith and rejoicing and praising always you know and that there's power you know that the power of praise um yeah so i you know i i know some people i guess they were affected by those books from years ago i don't know if you've ever heard of them is is it carruthers like prison to praise and he wrote a couple of these books on praising God and and even the worst <laughs> circumstances. But I just I know people that they're a big part of their spirituality. No matter how tough things are going, they they remain positive. They keep praising the Lord. They keep you know being grateful to the Lord. And uh, it's just a beautiful faith you know image or faith faith way of living. And and to me, one of the primary scriptures of this is is this you know. I think about that, you know, and it's like, if we want to be used by, by God to this level, because a lot of people will say, Oh, I just want God to do something great through me. And I want mm-hmm. my life to mean something. And I want to see amazing people are always saying, <coughs> how do we get back to this type of activity where we, you know, people would say, why don't we see the type of miracles in the church today that, that they saw in the book of Acts? Yeah. Maybe one of the reasons why is because we don't often see faith like this, like they had in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, who am I to say to the Lord, I want to see them amazing miracles. I want to see all this awesome stuff. Am I willing to be in the middle of a inner part of a dark prison in a foreign country after just having been beaten by rods for preaching the gospel? And then am I going to sing hymns? I mean, I don't know if I have that kind of faith, Father Mark. I, I think I would <laughs> probably be saying, "God, what's going on here? You've abandoned me. Where are you? Um, yeah. What What do I need to do? And and why does God hate me? Why does God left me? Why? I mean, we all do that. Yeah. We all have this tendency to look at our circumstances and then judge God's faithfulness to us based on those circumstances, especially when they're bad. When they're mm-hmm. good, we just kind of enjoy it and fly through it and don't always stop and say thank you that's human nature i mean i I think of jesus and the 10 lepers and only one return or or whatever and jesus said what happened to the other nine? where are these other guys that i that i healed when when things are going good when god does these things for us we can easily just take it for granted and move on but when things are bad when they're difficult then we're all like hey this isn't fair this isn't fair. Mm-hmm. I've done this. I've done all the right things. Sometimes you can do all the right things, and the the darkest part of your life isn't the result of God abandoning you. It's it's you're exactly where God wants you because He has a purpose for you in that. And for Paul and and these and these other people that were with him on this trip, they 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 allowed God to work in them despite their circumstances around them. And it was almost like they said, we we know that this is what's going to happen. And in the darkest places, we're going to continue to praise the Lord. And that's what led to all of these amazing things happening. The earthquake, the jailer coming in, afraid that he was going to be in trouble for these men getting out. And mm-hmm. then him saying to them, okay, this is real. Their response to this adversity was what showed him who God was. Mm-hmm. And... Mm-hmm. We might not have that type of adversity, but our response to whatever adversity we have is a witness to who God is to other people in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that can be huge for people if they see how we respond and how our faith is strong, no matter what's happening to us, people can look at it and go, man, I don't know how you went through that and held your faith. I would have given up. Wow. There must be something to this Jesus stuff. So... It's an amazing story, and I want everyone to, to think about that. When you're faced with adversity, when you're in that dark place, don't lose hope. Don't stop praising God. Don't give up 
because it might be in that that God can be most glorified in your life. So Paul, on the other hand, he, he's, he's got a little bit of an issue here because after the next day, the, the jailer basically is saying that, hey, Paul, the magistrates, they, they decided let's just let you go. They say, let these men go. And the jailer reports the words to Paul saying, um, you know what, go ahead and leave. You, you guys can get out of here now. But Paul doesn't want to go. He says, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens. They've thrown us into prison. And do they cast us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. And he reported these words to the magistrate because they're Roman citizens. So Paul, even with all of that, even with responding the way it was, Paul wasn't saying that I'm giving up my rights as a citizen and I'm going to allow people to treat me unjustly without any recourse. He's saying, look, you know, I have rights too. And if you're going to, you're going to let me go, you're going to come out here and publicly and publicly do this. And I think that's important too for, for, for Christians. And, and as we're persecuted, that doesn't mean that we have to roll over and just allow people in this world and this culture to abuse us. And that we, that we basically have no rights and are at whatever whim of the culture and society with, with regard to that. We need to stand up and we need to, to, to hold people accountable when they, when they abuse us. And, and that's, yeah. that's what he said. Yep. I mean, every, every society is supposed to have some kind of a legal system for justice and the rights of the people. And, you know, uh, we should uh, uphold those and, and, you know, appeal to them and, and, you know, demand that we keep justice, not just for ourselves, but for others. So, yeah, Paul's tough as nails, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> Very impressive. Yeah. So, okay, so then they take off. We're going to move into Chapter 17 here. And it says they'd passed through uh, Amphilippus and Ap- Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica. Okay, Thessal- the book of Thessalonians. This is written to the church at Thessalonica. And we're going to we're gonna fl- fly through some of this stuff because I really want to get to what happens here when he, when he leaves Thessalonica and goes to Athens. But there's one verse in, in, in this chapter 17, the first part, that I want to, to highlight. That First of all, the pattern of Paul and his companions is typically to go into a city, go to the synagogue where the Jews would worship, and then preach Jesus to them. And that's yeah. exactly what they do. And he says to them, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. And it says some were persuaded and joined them, and some were not persuaded and joined them. And then again, at the same time, you have the Jews who usually get jealous, they stir up trouble, and they usually try to find a way to get rid of these guys. And I, I like this 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 quote of the Jews here. It says, it says this: these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Okay, mm-hmm. that's what's happening. These men are turning the world upside down. That's their reputation. It says, these guys who have turned the world upside down, they are here also. And so then they stir up all these authorities, and they basically try to get them in trouble. A few people believe, and some don't. And eventually, they send these guys off to, to, to Greece. So they're going to Athens. And what, I love this. In verse 16, it says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. And he saw that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. But some also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers met him. And some said, what would this babbler say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he preached Jesus in the resurrection. And they took hold of him and they bought him to Aragapas and Arapagas. Er, Arapagas. Hard to say these things sometimes. May we know what this new teaching is you present. For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish, therefore, to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So that's what these guys did. They always wanted to talk mm-hmm. about, you know, what's this new teaching? What are, what are these guys doing? Who are Tell us, mm-hmm. tell us. Mm-hmm. So they basically, they tee it up for him, and they say, tell us what's going on. And I love, I love Paul's response here. Verse 22, standing in the, in the middle of the Areopagus, he says, Men of Athens, 
I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship and found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines built by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. But since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything, and he made from one nation a, a, a no, made from every made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having been determined allotted periods and boundaries in their habitation. And then he he goes on and begins to to preach the gospel to these guys, and he basically says that the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. So he's basically telling them about Jesus. Now, this is a pretty good example. You know, we, we have a lot, and we could talk about this a lot, but we have all of this stuff right now where people are talking about idols and the Pachimamas and, and the Amazonian region and how do we preach to them and what do we do. But here's how we see Paul did it. What, what are your impressions of that, Father Mark? Yeah, well, I mean, like you say, there's... With St. Paul, there's that urgency to, to to preach the Lord Jesus, and I mean you don't you don't see much kind of pandering to to the idolaters. There's there's a clear, definitive, unambiguous call to reject the idols as a completely useless. You know, you don't need those in your life. As a matter of fact, they're they're a hindrance from, um, you know, being in communion with the one true God in Jesus. And and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think you and I see eye to eye on this, this, this whole notion that some are presenting today in the church that, oh, you know, we should really kind of um, uh, have some a deeper respect and understanding for the kind of idolatry of the past. We're just like, no way, <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't mean that we, we need to go, you know, I don't know what, you know, beating people up or something or being uncivil about how, how we do things, but there has to be, we, we have to get our, 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 you know, a clarity and backbone back as Catholics and, and, and just have that clear black and white, proclamation that there's you know the idolatry is evil you know it's it's it it, it leads people astray it's a complete waste of time and is is, is harmful and uh, paul we see this with paul well i think what's interesting too is when he comes to the city the first thing he does in athens while he's waiting is he walks around and he yeah. looks at their he looks at what these people are doing and how they're practicing their religion and I think what he's trying to do is find some common ground so that he can preach the gospel. And he says, you know, I perceive you guys are very religious. You have this understanding of, of, of a creator or something beyond just the physical realm. Now, let me tell you where that comes from. And let me show you this. this it's almost like this inner longing they have to connect with the divine is there and he he honors that but he says but let me show you where that where that really comes from and the the fullness and the truth of that versus all these idols that you have so this unknown god i, I love that idea of the unknown god because really that's what this is about people everywhere every culture every society every time place whatever all have this built-in desire and this knowledge that god is real that's why every culture has a religion at some point in time, because, because there's that inward revelation of the Holy Spirit and the outward revelation of creation that, that Romans talks about that proves that God is real to all of us. We just know it inherently. So what we do is we try to exercise that and connect with that through these different ways. And Paul is saying, I I'm glad that you express that and that you have that. Let me show you the right way, you know? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say, well... We can take what you do and blend it with what we do. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, it's okay to have your your unknown idols over here or your idols over here, and we'll just mix them together, and it'll be fine. He doesn't do that. He says, all the other idols, they're worthless. 
let me tell let me talk to you about the one true God. And then he talks to him about Jesus. And his evidence, of course, is because God raised him from the dead. I mean, that's the bottom line. These other idols, they don't they're no they're nothing. They're mm-hmm, they're fake, mm-hmm. they're created, they're they're human, they're human creations. They're not connected to reality. But Jesus Christ is he was real. He was a real mm-hmm. person that lived and that died and that rose again. And that's mm-hmm. the ultimate proof that he was who he said he was. And ultimately, I think that's a good a good way to approach this idea of evangelism mm-hmm. is to say to people, yeah, you know, we're not just going to come in there and bulldoze your city, but mm-hmm. we're going to come in there and we're going to we're going to explain to you that yeah, these things that you feel connected to in a transcendent way that reveals that you have this desire for God, but we're going to talk to you about the reality of God, not and and, and these idols, they're they're not it, they're not yeah. it. Yeah. So I mean, the, there yeah. there is there is the valid point that, like you said, Paul didn't go in and just bulldoze the whole thing. You know, there there was some sense of these people being spiritual and he found something in their you know practice that was kind of a pointer you know and so i you know i guess the people who would say hey like listen when you when you encounter different religions or belief systems or whatever tribes with their practices you know don't don't be too quick to just wholesale write off every single thing you know, there may be things that are, I guess what Vatican II calls seeds of the gospel, you know. I mean, I know the native people up here in Canada, um, you know, I, I'm told that they they did have a sense of the one creator who is good of all things and sustains life. life. Yeah. And so, the, you know, the missionaries would have affirmed that um, and so on. So... Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, I guess it's a, I guess that Pachamama thing just threw us off, you know, it just made us so frustrated and angry. You know? So anyways, yeah, they should, I, they should have never had those Pachamama idols in, in the churches and all like that's, you know, I mean, I, I that just, that did not help, you know, the, our, our uh, I don't know what, you know, or, or sense of, you know, the, the, the distinctiveness of Christianity. And yeah, anyway. I, don't, I mean, we've talked about that before, and I don't get it either. And I, the funny thing is that maybe it's not a funny thing. Maybe it's a sad thing. I don't hear anybody defending that. I, no. I, I don't hear anybody going, what are you talking about? It was good to have Pachimamas in the church. Um, you know, I mean, I guess maybe some of the some of the cardinals or whatever that are off in left field someplace, but I, I don't hear like regular Catholic people um, on YouTube or on Twitter or whatever, or wherever people talk about this stuff. I don't hear anybody going, well, we should really, you know, cut them a break. And maybe the Pachamamas aren't so bad. Everybody's just like, come yeah. on, man. Yeah. What the heck was this? Why are we doing this? So yeah. I, I'm with you. I think that was a, that was a dark spot in in recent or present times and in, in what's going on in the church mm-hmm. because I don't think it's helpful at all. And it's, I mean, it's not even just not helpful. It's just, in my opinion, this is my opinion. I, I just think it was a really, really bad thing to do. And I, I think that hopefully the Lord is, is giving us grace in this, but I do think that, I think that there's some consequences to that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I just can't imagine the Apostle Paul <clears throat> grabbing one of these idols that these people had and saying, well, we're going to take this with us and set this up in the synagogue when we go in and preach preach Jesus, and we're just going to honor this culture with these idols. I mean, the whole reason why they were there was to preach against idolatry and to preach Jesus Christ, and, that, and that's what he did. And I think you want to talk about how to minister to regions of the world, this is how you do it. You read this. And then you do what it did, what they did, and mm-hmm. these men just—they went, they found common ground, they ministered to people, and they preached Jesus, and that's the model that we see. Now, um, 
moving into chapter 18, okay, we're going to see Paul going to Corinth. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get all the way through chapter 18. Um, my, my prophetic words of not being able to make it as far as I hoped, I think, are coming true uh, because we're, we're closing in on 45 minutes right now. But we're going to see Paul in Corinth. And while he's there in Corinth, you know, again, he's occupied with preaching, testifying to the Jews that, that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he, he goes to the Jews, and I think he's just getting a little frustrated sometimes. And they're just like, look, I'm sick and tired of arguing with you people. If, if you're not going to listen to me, if you're not going to receive Christ, then I, there's nothing more I can do for you. I'm out of here. So then it says he left and went to a, a house of a man named named. Titius, a Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. See, everybody, everybody wasn't on the same page. Some people believed, others didn't. So this Crispus, he was, he was a high up guy in the synagogue. And together with all his household, many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, "Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man shall attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city." And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So, I mean, think about that. It's a long time. He get, camps out here, and he's going to stay. So even though he was, like, upset, he's like, I'm not doing this, man. People came to him. They, they ministered to him, and the Lord said, just chill. That's my, that's my paraphrase. Just be here. I've got, I've got people for you here in this city. So he spends a year there. In six months, a year and a half, and does great ministry. And I, I think I'm going to have everybody just sort of read through the rest of this. We'll get to we'll get to the second half of chapter 18 next week, and then we're going to move into in chapter 19. One of the most important stories, I think, is what happens when Paul encounters these demons in the sons of Sceva. Well, and we're going to look at that, I think, in detail next week. But read read. Read into 18 and see what happens when the Holy Spirit begins to fall on, on these people. It's powerful stuff, his, his, his ministry there in Corinth. So, I don't know, do you have any, any thoughts about, about this whole idea of shaking the dust off your feet and saying, I, I don't want to do this anymore, but I'm frustrated. I mean, even Paul got frustrated, but God says, just, just hang on, it's all going to be good. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Paul was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was working in power. And I guess the, he was just sharing in the mystery of Christ, you know. I mean, the Lord yeah. Jesus worked wonders. He, 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 the Lord Jesus was, was a good man. He, um, you know, spoke wonderful, you know, uh, words, and his words were confirmed. But some people received Jesus' message, and some people didn't. And, and Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. So it, it just makes sense that Paul is going to experience that. And it's the mystery, Keith. It's it's just the mystery of, you know, the human heart, the human soul, and, and how some people open their heart to God's word, and the word comes in and bears fruit, and other people are just resistant and, and yeah. hardened or maybe just not ready at mm -hmm. that moment. I mean, there's always the hope that, a person will come around, you know, like uh, maybe at this point in their life, they're just not there yet. But maybe 20 years from now, they they, they will be. Uh, but obviously, you hope and you pray that every person, you know, accepts the Lord Jesus, opens their heart to the Lord and, and um, you know, finds salvation and eternal life. Uh, so So Paul is just, he's... He's not back, backing down. I mean, it's just so edifying to see his unrelenting um, focus and, and fervor to, to preach the Lord Jesus and, uh, and thank God for him. I mean, he, uh, he really pushed Christianity forward. But, of course, it was the Holy Spirit. You know, it was the Lord giving him the grace and, and leading him. We see the Spirit leading him so clearly. And so, yeah. Amen. Yeah, to be led by the Spirit is really the goal. I mean, people are always saying, should I do this? Should I do that? What college should I go to? What job should I have? What this? What? Sometimes 
we're going to know the answers to those things. Other times, we just have to be led by the Spirit mm -hmm. and see what God will do. And that's exactly what we see here in, in these chapters in Acts. And so I want to encourage everybody, read, read I, I, I read some and overviewed some, so um, I would encourage everybody, read these things word by word. So read 16 through 18 this, this next week. And, and I know, Father Mark, you're going to be gone next week, so we'll pick this up in a couple weeks. But um, read, so read 16 through 18 just again as an overview with, with this. And then start to read into 19. We're going to get into 19 next week as these journeys continue. And, and believe it or not, we are making our way through the Acts pretty quickly here now because there's only 28 chapters. And that means we've got about 18 or about 10 chapters left. And because we're in 18 and we're going to see some amazing stuff here. So I hope you guys are, are continuing to dig into it. I appreciate the comments that we're seeing in the in the uh, about um, the videos and how they're helping you. I, I pray. I mean, we're not like the most organized, structured Bible study here. And we just open it, read it and talk about it and see what the Lord does. And I think that's that's a good way to do it. But continue in your own spiritual uh, disciplines to dig deep. Study, pray, seek the Lord. And when you find yourself in those dark places, like what we see here with Paul and Silas, don't give up. Praise God and everything. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul writes. And again, I say rejoice. There's nothing that can happen to you that can take you away from the love of God. Only, only that which we do to ourselves when we, we choose to walk away. So let's stay strong in our faith. Let's stay strong in the Lord. And, and in that, we will be a light to this world and Christ will shine through us and, and people around will see that and hopefully come to know Christ as well too. Any, any closing thoughts from you, Father Mark? Amen. That's beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> Just uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us in this uh, Bible study and uh, Keith, you're doing, you're doing a real good job uh, kind of leading us in this. And uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful book of the Bible. Well, thank you so much again for being here, Father Mark. Would you uh, close us with uh, a blessing today? Lord, pour out your blessing, pour out your anointing, pour out the full grace of your Holy Spirit upon uh, just all these viewers, Lord, who are uh, spending time in your word. And may Almighty God bless everyone, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Father Mark. God bless you all. Thank you, Keith. God bless you.